Good morning. Woke up probably two hours ago, still finishing my coffee, but uh, after getting my son ready for school and getting him loaded up into the car so his mom could take him, I came back to my office and do what I typically do, which is I open the curtains, let the light in, and uh, I just sat here at my table and I was reading a book. I'm currently reading The Comfort Crisis. I've read it before uh, a few times, very good book. But uh, although you can't see it, I have a small stack of books that are on the subject of, of teaching English uh, over on my desk over here. That's because, of course, I live in Taiwan, and sometimes I will do some private tutoring um, for neighbors, children, thing like things like that, some ESL tutoring. Um, I also work with a book publishing company, and I will go to schools in various parts of Taiwan, and I will basically be like a, a guest speaker uh, for students there, and basically having things like the Oxford Picture Dictionary or, or various other little visual uh, learning tools is, is useful for kids. And uh, past those separate books that are for that purpose on my desk over there, above my head behind me, I have books that I read like this one that are, that are more so just for enjoyment, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, whether it's a novel or a biography, it doesn't really matter if it's, if it's something being read just because I want to, to read the story, I'm interested in the story itself, enjoyment reading. Um, and in that realm, they go over there. If it is photography related, those go on another desk that takes up the corner right behind the camera, actually directly behind the camera. And a lot of those books, because they're related to photography, many of them are physically very large and they won't fit on a standard small bookshelf. They'll, they'll spill out over the edge too much. So those are stacked on a desk over there, taking up that entire wall. And then on this separate shelf above my computer monitor, above the mirror, I have a, another shelf that has training related books specifically related to whether it's human anatomy. Like I have the Atlas of human anatomy. That one is in, I love, actually I'm going to grab it and show you. So I have training specific related books that I'm interested in that, that are full of, of modern research findings and anecdotal evidence and things like that stuff whether it's um, the system, which is based on all of the training knowledge accumulated through uh, the Soviet the uh, Soviet Union during the Cold War and has been adapted for the American strength athlete, or it's stuff like practical programming for strength training by Mark Ripito, uh, stuff like that, training specifically. But I also love uh, old stuff. More specifically, I really, really enjoy literature, uh, medical literature or scientific literature that was printed anywhere from the 60s to the 80s. That seems to kind of be a golden era where whether it was because of international tensions of uh, the, you know, the Cold War that was happening or this or that, our culture in general seemed to focus on and prioritize just truth, really. There was no lobbying of, from some company to get a favorable result. There was no money really changing hands, the backdoor deals, things like that. It was really just a pure pursuit of knowledge. And uh, a lot of the literature, medical literature, scientific literature you find printed between the 60s and the 80s seemed to be this era where we had enough advanced uh, ways of studying things and we we had enough modern technology modern technology that we could really get a lot done especially with very smart clever people being dedicated to the cause um, but there was much less conflicting data that it was much more pure pursuit of like this is these are just the facts and it was still a time when also um, there seemed to be an appreciation for art art and science still went together pretty well, kind of the art of science. As a great example, um, I have this stack of books here. 
Uh, this one is not so old. I think maybe it was originally published in the early 90s, maybe late 80s, early 90s. I'd have to check to be sure, but this is just uh, Williams and Listener's uh, Biomechanics of Human Motion, uh, the third edition. But I'll give you an example here. Uh, when you look in here, you see some pretty, pretty basic illustrations, but they're still good illustrations. And that's what I like is it's not only giving you very solid, just here's the, the good information, no bias, this is just how it works. And it's, it's doing a great job of, of introducing a, a mixture of different realms of research to, to come together and show you really effectively the biomechanics of human movement. Um, but again, it's still overall compared to some of the older stuff, it's this has become a little more basic. Now, if we go back, oh, here's a good, I don't know if you can see that very well, but a picture of the, the shoulder and the upper arm in a bent position with the muscle structure there. But if we go back further to something like this, the Atlas of Human Anatomy. Atlas of Human Anatomy, this one was originally published in the 60s, I believe maybe 1968, again, I'd have to confirm. But now when I open this, immediately the first thing I open, there we go, look at that. Amazing, just beautiful illustrations, like very highly detailed. They, they hired an actual artist to come in and, and give a highly detailed breakdown of, of these structures. And this, they do this for everything. Um, even if you're not reading, even just to flip through the pages, it's it's like being it's like looking at the work of, of Da Vinci or something, seeing this unbelievably detailed illustration that had a, that had the scientific expertise of this is the actual structure. These are these are based in reality, but had the devotion of a dedicated artist wanting to render it correctly. Yeah, just amazing stuff. And I, I have an appreciation for that. Uh, same with this. I have a, an atlas of, of surgical techniques. This was from 1962, um, which quite literally shows you step by step how to do various surgical techniques. Um, the manual of operative procedure and surgical knots. Very, very cool, but a great, again, great illustrations. This is also from the 60s. Um, then there's this aside, this is not nearly as old or cool, but it, it goes with the subject matter. This the time uh, atlas of the body. Anyway, what I'm getting at with all that is this is, I'm not talking about books in this video, but what I'm getting at is that I, I like books. And I don't just mean... I like reading books or the, the process of reading. I mean, for some unknown reason, I can't quite put my thumb on. I've always just liked the physical, tangible block of bound paper we call a book. I've always thought books were very cool in concept. Just to have a wall full of books looks cool. It's, it's an attractive thing. Um, to see someone reading a book, to carry a book, to have a book that is your favorite or that you really care about, that you can dive into. Just everything surrounding that concept I've always thought was very cool. And I never knew why. It's just That's just how it was. And along with that, I always just so happened to like things like straight razors. I actually have a collection of, of vintage straight razors. Some of those over there are over 100 years old. And among my many tattoos, I have straight razors, among other things, tattooed uh, on my hips, one on each hip. And I never knew why, really. Just since before I could remember, I've always thought visually straight razors were just really cool, fascinating things. I also, of course, don't just like uh, you know, books and straight razors, but this, this pattern of specific items is, is repeated over and over again. I've always been attracted to briefcases. Again, I don't know why. I just like briefcases. In fact, 
This is my briefcase. An old school uh, vintage hard shell briefcase. Um, and I actually use this and I really enjoy it. But before I ever owned a briefcase, I always wanted to own a briefcase. I didn't know why I would ever need one. I felt a little self-conscious about the idea of having one once I bought it. Uh, what if what if I'm questioned? What if someone can tell by looking at me I'm not the kind of person that needs a briefcase? Uh, but then eventually one day I just kind of figured out that it's a useful thing to have like anything else, especially if you're carrying books and paperwork and things like that. Just grab a briefcase. There's a reason why basically everybody in previous generations used to carry these things. Just like a mechanic carries a toolbox. Um, an iron worker might carry the Stanley lunchbox with his lunch and his coffee and everything he needs on the job site for his lunch break later. Uh, some people carry briefcases. And now that I have one, I love it. And I still think they're fascinating. Anytime I'm at a secondhand store or at a flea market or somewhere and I see a vintage briefcase, I just think they're cool and I want to buy them. I don't because I don't want to collect briefcases, but they're just something about them is cool. It's the same with typewriters. I've never really talked about it on this channel, but I have always been fascinated with typewriters. It's not because one of these things may or may not be trendy at some time. It's not because pop culture. It's not because it reminds me of something else. There's just this weird internal pull where ever since I was a child and I would first see pictures or in movies or shows or in the real world, if I saw a typewriter, I just thought it was awesome. There was something about the just the mechanical nature, the, the, the engineering of the knobs and the buttons and, and swiveling, swinging arms and pieces of metal and the noises and like a watch, because I also am a big fan of watches, just like watches or anything else, just the very fine engineering that goes into it. And it's probably the same reason why I like cameras so much. Just even the camera itself, aside from photography, the camera itself as a, as a engineering marvel is amazing. And I recently picked up this typewriter, which I actually typed up immediately an entire story about how I found the typewriter on that typewriter. This is an Olympia SM9. I just got it yesterday, less than 24 hours ago. And it was one of those typewriters that's been on my list of something I wanted to find for a very long time. I have owned dozens of typewriters. As a side hobby, I actually love the process of finding them in any condition. And either they still work as is, and then it's fun to play with it and type and experience it. and Because they're all a little bit different in how they work and how they feel and the typeface. Everything's different on every typewriter. But if they don't work, that's even better because then I can go through the process of disassembling the thing and, and figuring out what's wrong and getting it back into working order. And the feeling of satisfaction of, of repairing one of these old machines is, is, is phenomenal. It's amazing. But my favorite brand of typewriter, I've, I've had many. I've had typewriters that are nearly 100 years old and I've had very modern, low-end, crappy typewriters. Uh from American companies, European companies, Japanese companies, all of them. And my favorite brand has been Olympia. It's just, I'm not going to dive into that because again, this video is not even about typewriters, but my favorite typewriters are made by Olympia. I believe they were the highest quality and um, the finest typing instruments you could buy. And it is widely believed that the SM9 was the pinnacle of the typewriter. Now, if you want to add less outright durability and more just the artistic approach of the pinnacle of typewriters, people might say it was the Hermes 3000. But when it comes to outright just reliability, it has all the features, it does everything, it feels phenomenal to type on, the type experience. Everything is perfectly straight. Every letter is perfectly printed. It's predictable. It's reliable. It will survive the apocalypse. The SM9 was the way to go. And everybody knows that. So they're actually kind of hard to find. And when you do find them, they're either not for sale or they are for sale, but they're very expensive. Uh, even in today's world of people not caring about typewriters. Or 
you find one that is uh it is for sale and it's not particularly expensive but it's also very barely an sm9 anymore it's uh it has lived a rough life to say the least and uh, this one again i'll i'll maybe post the story at the end but the way i found this one was uh something i'll probably remember forever but um using it it lived up to the hype and it reminds me of just how much i love these machines but as I placed this on my desk and I was typing last night, for example, I was also going through some of these photos. Some of these I'm separating because aside from putting photos on my wall, I also like to take some of my favorite photos from time to time and I'll put them in my car. I'll actually, I'll pin them to the, to the ceiling, to the, to the liner, to the ceiling liner of my car with little thumbtacks. And I'm gonna put this back. And as I am going through these photos and deciding, because I like them all, obviously, that's why I bothered printing them, but I'm trying to decide, you know, there's only so much room in my car and I don't want to have too many photos from the same trip. I you know, try to narrow down each moment in time, each group of memories to being represented by a single photo and I'm trying to choose. I'm also being reminded of how much, like I've said in other videos, how much I like physical tangible photos like a printed photo which is so rare these days it seems like nobody prints their photos and i've i've begged and i've pleaded and i've i've tried to give the case for printing photos in other videos but it was occurring to me again why is it that i i enjoy printing photos so much why what is it makes it so special to have a physical copy in my hand i'm seeing the same image either way whether I'm viewing it on a computer screen or I'm viewing it on my phone or I'm viewing it on the back of the camera, the, the screen, or I'm viewing it here in my hand, it's the same photo. So why is it that I'm so attracted to this? What makes this special? And it was actually the SM9 just last night that was the light bulb moment. As I said a moment ago, the SM9 is considered the apocalypse proof. You know, it will survive past the cockroaches it'll it'll live no matter what and that was the light bulb moment that's what it is printing your photos is apocalypse proof and then i expanded on that thought and i started to realize you know, that actually might be the running theme on a subconscious level that i never realized what makes me enjoy all these things is the fact that you know nothing is infinite everything is finite everything ends at some point but at least in the realm of our existence our lifetime or a few generations worth um some things just seem to endure they they represent a type of permanence uh and there's something, I don't know if the word is soothing or attractive or fascinating or just cool about that. Maybe it's a mixture of all the things, but I definitely appreciate that something will, will outlast me, will be here longer than I am. And that's what all these things have in common. I am not anti-technology. I'm speaking into a piece of technology right here. This is a microphone and as a camera, and I'm going to edit this video on a computer. I'm going to upload it to the internet. I have a 3D printer right in front of me. I am a fan of technology. But at the same time, I think it's an unfortunate part of the human condition that we get carried away with anything. It's just it's just how humans are. It's uh, the reason why so many people these days um, are overweight. It's not because something has changed in our DNA that makes it so that we have to be overweight. It's just because we have these internal drives to eat more than necessary so that we don't starve. So that if, if the lean times come, if if suddenly the next meal doesn't come around, like for most of our history, it might not come, we won't starve. 
now we live in a society where we have food security. Most people have food security, but we still have that internal instinct to just eat a little extra just in case. And that gives us the, the extra weight. But no matter how many, how much we add to that, no matter how good we get about convenience. I mean, think we had food security a hundred years ago. We had grocery stores. Somebody butchered our food for us. We had farming on an industrial scale. Um, but yet it still progresses. It's not good enough. We need to make it better. So technology improves when we do more to the point where now in any country in the world, nearly any, any modern country anyway, um, people quite literally don't even have to leave their homes. You could, if you wanted to be a, a shut in, you could enter your home and theoretically never have to leave ever again. You could do your work from the computer, uh, work from home. You could use your phone and various apps, you know, Uber Eats and things like that to have food delivered to you, whether it's takeout or it's your groceries. You, you can even have an app to have somebody go shopping for you. Um, you can stream all of your entertainment, all of your shows, all the stuff you want to watch. You can do telemedicine. It's, uh, it's amazing how far we've pushed this internal subconscious instinct of wanting to, of wanting to consume as much as possible while preserving as much as possible, not just with food, but it expands to everything. How can we, no matter how good it is, how can we make it better? So that's not a bad thing inherently. That's the reason why medicine continues to improve. That's the reason why technology improves. That's the reason why we're able to, to advance as a species. But I think that it's very easy to always look forward and to always be moving forward and to always think inherently part of our nature is to think what's next, what's next, how can this be better is to immediately feel like not to use a, a cliche example, but no matter how good your phone is and how amazing and futuristic it is. And man, I wish I could have that phone. It's just so expensive though. These phones are getting outrageously priced and then someday you actually get it. And then wouldn't you know it, it's a year later or two years later, it's no longer the most modern, futuristic, amazing thing anymore. If you are lucky, you might just, you don't hate it. You just feel like it's normal. This is just, it's just a normal part of your reality. It's just, it's the baseline. That's what should be there. But for many people, increasingly, it's not even the baseline. It's too old. It's slow. It, the camera's not good enough. It just, it's crappy. God, you know, not enough storage and it's no longer good enough. I need to find the next thing. I need to upgrade my phone. And that's, that's the mentality as people that we have with everything. What's the next, next best thing? How can things be upgraded? It's part of the reason why with cameras, no matter how good an old camera is like that 5d classic over there, many people will never pick it up. They'll never try it. They don't care. Because right now, more the more modern cameras can do everything that that can't. They can record video, 8K, um, modern advanced autofocus algorithms, unlimited recording. They have GPS built in. They have all these ways to extend battery life. They have USB charging. All this stuff, that's just too old. The 5D isn't good anymore. And on a subconscious primal level, I guess without ever realizing it, as much as I appreciate these modern things, I also, without even thinking about it, just, it just occurs to me that there's something inside me that appreciates good engineering. I appreciate something that has a permanent place or could have a permanent place where we should keep around. Even if it's not modern tech, we should keep it around because it serves a unique purpose. And the SM nine, when I was thinking about it being apocalypse proof, that was the light bulb. I like these things. I think 
because they are all apocalypse proof. They, if something happened, if again, if whether it was World War Three or an asteroid struck the Earth or whatever it was, all the volcanoes erupted at once. If something happened, and humanity and society, civilization got reset. As, as amazing as the internet is, we wouldn't have it anymore. All of that information would be gone. As convenient and absolutely useful and practical and, and life-saving our phones can be, they'd be junk. They would be completely useless. There would no longer be a difference between an Android or an iPhone or what year it came out or the camera or the storage size. They would all be the same landfill they'd just be crap they'd, they'd serve zero purpose at all all those photos that i took that i never got printed if i theoretically never printed my photos would have essentially been for nothing i could never again see them they would quite literally be gone forever just dust in the wind but Even if there was no more internet, no more air conditioning, no more grocery store, no more hospital, no more electricity, everything got reset and I somehow survived that physically, I would still have memories of the way the world used to be because of these photos. Having this physical, tangible photo is apocalypse proof. The lights can go out, but that photo is still here. I can still see it. I can study it. I can be mesmerized by it. I can be taken back to that place in this photo. And as long as this physical photo is here in my hand, Nothing that happens in the outside world, nothing that happens with societies or technology or the grid structure or anything else, nothing is going to take this photo away from me. It's the same with these books. Audiobooks are amazing. I listen to audiobooks all the time. It's super convenient. But again, if, if the lights go out, the internet goes down, Audible is useless. My ebooks are gone. But if I've got this collection of physical, actual, physical media, I can read the stories here. If I want to be adventured off into a magical fairy tale place, I can read this fiction novel that I have over here. If I want to read a very interesting biography, I want to be, I want to be, you know, cemented. I want to be weighted down in the real world of things that have actually happened. I can read this book over here. If I want to, if I want to laugh, I can read that book. If I want to feel sad, I can read this other book. If I don't want to read anything. I just want to look and observe and be taken away to the beautiful mesmerizing places that exist or the moments that have been captured. I have any of those books over there. If I want to remember my own life, my children, my experiences, I have all these photos behind me. If I want to type away, you know, just to sit and type and have a perfectly structured page full of my thoughts. This requires no electricity. I have this, this machine right here, which if it ever somehow breaks down, I can fix myself. It's usually just a matter of cleaning it. Same with the straight razors, even now that I think about it. As you can see, I'm not big on keeping a clean shave, but those straight razors over there, are over a hundred years old. Many of them are over a hundred years old and they still hold a razor sharp edge. I can still put it on the strope and shave if I want to. 
That is one single blade. One single piece of steel that was folded and heated and hammered and shaped and sharpened and placed into its, its handle and sold to somebody over in England or this other one over in Germany around the Industrial Revolution over a hundred years ago. And they were able to shave and keep, keep a clean shave every single day for the rest of their life with this single blade. And eventually it got passed down to their children or grandchildren or whoever else, and they could shave with it. And eventually people stopped shaving every day with these things, but they still kept them as a collection. They did it just as a, every once in a while, this is a special occasion. Or maybe they just never shaved at all. Like me, I don't shave with those typically. I have, I've shaved with all of them just because it's fun. But if I ever decide, you know what? I'm gonna break out the straight razor. It'll shave as good today as it ever did before. That's the ultimate form of, if you care about the environment, like that's the ultimate sustainability. Not disposable razors, not the the Mach 3, Mach 5, not the modern fancy blah, blah, blah. I've also got electric razors. I've got uh, a Panasonic Arc 5 over there. I've got the Andis Profoil. Or when I was did I was used to work as a barber, so I have that. And those are cool, but again, those are temporary. No matter how long they last or how well they work, at some point they're going to break down. And they're going to stop working, or they're going to need to have the 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 parts replaced, or it needs to be charged. With no electricity, I can't use it. But that straight razor, that was one blade. One blade made from one piece of steel over a hundred years ago, and I can still shave with it today. I don't actively think about this stuff, but it's something that now that I, I, I connect the dots and I think about this stuff, you know, I'm not a prepper. Um, I don't have any gas masks like NBC masks stored in this office, but that theoretical concept of something being apocalypse proof is just fascinating. And it makes me, I don't know. I want to say I wish people would appreciate these things more. And I guess that's true, but it's not in a, in a frustrated sort of way. I'm not upset that people don't appreciate these things. I'm, I don't feel any need to convince everyone that they have to, to like these things that I like, or that everyone has to own a typewriter. But I guess this is a, it's less about just about the photos or just about the camera. It's not even really trying to be philosophical, but I guess it, it accidentally lands in that realm of philosophy that modern, modern tech is amazing. Modern things are nice. They have changed the world in many ways for the better. Um, Modern cameras, again, I, I have purchased and owned many modern cameras, brand new, out of the camera shop, spent way too much money, and they do amazing things. They do everything they're supposed to do. But every camera has its own personality. It's not just the buttons and dials. It's not just the, the lens mount. One of the reasons why the 5D Classic is so popular is because of the way that it sees the world. It's the way that it renders an image. It's so easy to get lost and to get stuck in that loop of, of tech specs. Well, how many megapixels is it? Well, what, what's the dynamic range? Well, what about the bit depth? Um, but it kind of doesn't matter. It's very easy to tell yourself that it matters and tell yourself all the reasons why it matters. But really, at the end of the day, it takes photos. And if you like the way that the photos look, if you can take a photo with this camera, if you can carry it with you and you can use it and you enjoy using it, aside from the photos themselves, if you just like the way this camera looks, if you like the way it feels in your hand, if you enjoy using it, that alone is a special thing. 
you should enjoy things in your life. You should, you should reward yourself by just allowing yourself to enjoy something. If you enjoy it, who cares if you need it? Who cares if it's the best ever? Who cares about the tech specs? If you enjoy it, man, just enjoy it. Allow yourself to enjoy this thing. Even better, if after you've carried it with you and if you've used it and you've had fun and you've enjoyed it, if you then get the photos later, either on your computer or you print them out, and you, like many people, fall in love with the way that the 5D Classic sees the world, if you love the way that it renders, then as you're looking at these photos and appreciating these memories and maybe holding this, this physical page in your hand or putting it on your wall like I do, What bit depth? Who cares about dynamic range? It's a beautiful photo. The end. So, I don't know. <sighs> wish I had something more mainstream and exciting for you. I wish I could make this video shorter. Or I was reviewing a cool new camera. Or, uh... Or something else, but I've just been living life on my end. I don't, I don't follow an upload schedule. I don't, I don't feel like I need to upload certain types of videos at a certain time. I just, when there's a video I want to make, I make it. And what's on my mind right now, and what I kind of want to share with, what I hope is like-minded people, is uh, this appreciation for things that have a kind of a permanence to them. And that's the other thing I also wanted to say before in this video is I have been very pleasantly surprised by how many people uh, can relate to what I'm saying in these videos. I don't care about being an influencer or trying to, to hit a certain number of subscribers which thank God for that because that seems very stressful for people who, who tried to go that route. But I just assumed that because I'm not following the cliches, because I'm not uploading videos every Monday, every, every day, I'm not making sure that they stick to a certain time limit. I'm not going out of my way to create the structure of beginning, middle, end. I'm not, doing really ridiculous special effects and post-processing. I'm not subscribed to any sort of companies where I can get music or sound effects or, or B roll footage for, you know, for my videos. I'm not collaborating with people. Um, I'm just a guy in Taiwan with my books and my typewriters and my workshop upstairs, you know, I'm always welding and making stuff and my camera and, uh, in my office and I'm just, I'm living my life. And sometimes I talk into a camera and I, I tell you what's on my mind. I just assumed that nobody would watch these videos. Nobody would care. And if, for, if somehow, despite the lack of clickbait, if somebody ever clicked on one of these videos, they would uh, they would be bored to tears within seconds, and they'd click away. And there have been the fair share of comments where I'm doing a review of a camera, my experience with a certain camera, and the comment is really short, and it's something about you know I talk too much or it was something like that. People just they don't want to sit and listen; they want the quick you know in your face, typical YouTube, quickly tell me what to buy sort of thing. And they don't like that that's not what I'm doing. But the overwhelming majority of the comments that I get that's been really eye-opening to me is just how many people apparently are like me. Just real people who do have a good attention span, who do have an appreciation for, th for quality things despite maybe being old. People who understand and appreciate 
photography, not just the gear. People who who have a, a connection to the things that they they own or that they use. I've had so many amazing comments where people will tell me their own stories or they'll tell me their own experience in a certain place or with a certain type of camera or a certain lens. Um, and you have no idea how much I really enjoy reading some of these comments. Like it's, I've, I've had some really good comments. So despite the fact that I, it's not a super popular channel and that's not the goal, I do feel like I'll see some of the same people commenting on multiple videos. I recognize certain names. I recognize certain images and I read the stories and this and that. I do feel like there's like a little community of us like-minded individuals. So I do appreciate that. But anyway, I've been rambling long enough. Uh, don't even know what I'll call this video. I guess... Uh, Apocalypse proof. Anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.